actually, hold, hold one second, Whoa. boys and girls. We're yep, nope, sorry. I'm, I'm going off script. Uh, thank you, James, uh, and worship team, and all those that participated. Uh, boys and girls, before, we, before you guys leave today, uh, we have a family. Last, you know, I, I guess it was a couple of Sundays uh, that we mentioned that we had a family that was leaving and moving, and unfortunately, uh, we have another that, uh, that's, that's leaving and moving here in the near future, right? As a, as a military community, right, uh, the military giveth and the military taketh away, right? So uh, the Standridge family right over here, Preston has been gone for a little while. He's been doing some training for the Navy in California. Uh, Christina and the rest of the family has still been here, but they are moving here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and so we wanted to take, uh, and this actually is their, their last Sunday with us, so we wanted to take a moment this morning uh, and just recognize them. They have helped out in a variety of different things and all kinds of children's ministries and American Heritage Girls, right, and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so take a moment to pray for them. So today, right, if you're friends uh, with the Standridges, just know that, you know, you want to probably go say, uh, say your goodbyes today. Though hopefully we'll hear from them, and maybe if they're back in the neighborhood, uh, they'll come back and, and visit with us. But let me, uh, let me pray for them. Uh, and then we'll, we'll let you guys kind of dismiss to the back. Lord Jesus, we pray for the Standard family as they move from here, Lord, that you take them to their next destination. Uh, God, that you help them find another church that they can plug into quickly, that loves them, uh, that pours into them, that offers them a place that they can use their gifts to serve you. Uh, make the move smooth, make it seamless, uh, reunite uh, Preston and Christina after a number of months, uh, separated father, uh, and bless their family, Lord. Uh, may you increase them in every manner, God, uh, in the strength of their faith, uh, in the size of their family, in, in all things, Lord God. We pray your blessings upon them. And we pray it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for your, uh, for your service and your friendship here at Gal Pill. All right, boys and girls, you guys can, can head back. They, after one false start, right, we'll, we'll now send you back. Uh, as they're making their way out, a couple of, uh, a couple of announcements. One, uh, coming up on August 28th, right, is a new members class. Uh, I had tried to get this into the month of July, but it just didn't work out. So a number of you have asked me, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to be a member at Gallup Hill Baptist Church? What does it take to be a member at Gallup Hill Baptist Church? So Sunday, August 28th, after church, we'll gather up in the chapel. We'll probably do lunch, something like that, and then we'll talk about uh, what it means to, to be a member uh, of the church. So if that's something you're interested in, just kind of mark that Sunday off on your calendar. Last Sunday, really, before we go back to school, uh, and that's coming up next month. Hey, on Tuesday, uh, the Ledger Police Department is putting together, uh, on the town green, right in Ledger, just kind of right up in the center of town, a national night out. Uh, and so here's uh, kind of a description of what they're going to do. In, a, in an effort to help promote a positive police community partnership, to learn about and help prevent crime, drug use, and violence, and to ensure the safety of the members of our community. Uh, they're putting together a, a, a national night out. It's Tuesday night. It's from 5 to 8. It's on the town green. They're going to provide burgers, hot dogs, and drinks. There'll be bouncy houses, touch a truck, cornhole, water balloon toss, all kinds of stuff. So on Tuesday, I would encourage you guys uh, to go enjoy that and visit that, right, as we... Uh, Right as we honor, right, and and uh, participate in something that our local police department uh, is doing. Uh, next thing, right, I got I got a couple announcements today. Uh, we mentioned this last week, right? If you, if you look on the ground around you, you notice like there's white uh, and there's yellow lines that all you guys are sitting on, right? We have used the white lines for years uh, for basketball. The yellow lines are actually volleyball lines, uh, and so we are piloting this fall. Uh, a volleyball league for middle school girls age 6th to 8th grade. Uh, it's going to be a couple of nights a week here in the church gym, Mondays uh, and Thursdays. There'll be two sessions, one from 5.30 to 6.50, one from 7 to 8.20. And the purpose of this is just for our church to create another touch point uh, to youth and to families in our community, right, and to help bring them Christ and to help, you know, maybe already Christians grow in Christ, uh, through the sport of volleyball. We've done that pretty successfully through upward basketball for a number of years, uh, but it occurred to us, right, we've got this volleyball court, and believe it or not, there's actually holes in the floor back there where you put up a net, uh, and it's in good shape, and this is an opportunity. So there'll be uh, a chance to start signing up for that uh, this coming week. There'll be, uh, we'll start small this year with about 32, and we'll just kind of see where it goes from there. So if you want something to pray about, you can be praying about that. Uh, if you play volleyball, uh, or if that's something you're like, hmm, I might be interested in that, uh, come see me. Shoot me a text, shoot me an email. 
Okay. All right. You'll also notice, and you probably feel today, that all four of our air conditioners are finally in, right? So it's like, woohoo, right? A uh, couple of things. It'll take us a little while to kind of figure out. Some of you are like, I'm cold. Some of you are like, I'm still hot, right? So we'll get there. Uh, just give us a little, you know, a couple of Sundays to kind of figure it all out. You'll notice there's still got to put one thermostat in over right here. He'll be back here on Tuesday to do that. But, uh, but that said, you know, you control them from right here. Everybody just hang off of them. Don't, don't mess with them for a little bit. Let us figure out kind of, we'll find that, that comfortable spot where it's not humid and it's cool all at the same time. And you don't feel like you have to bring your winter coat in the summer, right? Because we do that enough in the winter. Uh, but just know, right, that's, that's all finishing up. And the new unit, if you didn't know, a unit in the old room back there died. It's coming in uh, on Tuesday. So those in the nursery that have been uh, really without air conditioning, it'll be back there next Sunday. All right, last thing. Uh, most of you guys know, right, we're not from here. My family's not from here. Uh, we'll be continuing the Daniel sermon series as we go through the month of August, but my family leaves the middle of this week uh, to head down south for a little bit of vacation. So for the, for the next three Sundays, somebody else is, is going to be preaching for me. We're going to continue through Daniel, but uh, for the Sundays of August 7th and August 14th, Joel Black will be preaching for me. Joel's an excellent preacher. You'll want to be here for that. Uh, and then the Sunday of August 21st, Aaron Cassavant will be filling in for me and preaching all three of both of those guys. Uh, excellent preachers, and highly encourage you to be here. I will be next Sunday preaching at my home church in Eufaula, Alabama, which I haven't been to in a number of years because of COVID and visiting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so just know we'll, we'll be back. Uh, we're only going to be down there about eight days this time, so we'll be back in the area, but uh, be out of the pulpit a couple of Sundays to give me a couple of Sundays off. For, so good things are being covered, right? Fiery furnaces next week. Joel will be talking about that. Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation the week after that. Joel will be talking about that. The writing on the wall. If you've ever wondered where that phrase come from, he saw the writing on the wall. Aaron will be covering that, uh, that third week. And then when I get back, we'll finish with the lion's den and, and perhaps one more. All right. All right. Good. Grab your Bibles, open up book of Daniel. Daniel's Old Testament, right? Uh, about ooh, almost all the way through the Old Testament. Daniel chapter two. Sermon series is called Faith and Faithfulness, right? And the question we're asking today, and this is a rather long passage. It's, it's almost 50 verses, I think. It's 49 verses. Long passage. But the question we're asking today is when the future is uncertain, okay? And the future is always uncertain. And the rubber kind of hits the road who are you going to turn to for guidance and advice and comfort and all of that, right? When, when the deep questions of life, like what's my tomorrow going to be or what does God have in store for me or what's coming for, for my community or my company or my country or, or my, my school or any of that, what is my tomorrow going to be? Where am I going in this life? Are you going to turn to the wisdom and the understanding of the world? Or maybe even of the spirit world? Or are you going to turn to the wisdom and comfort for God? And this chapter in the book of Daniel, uh, I think, is amazingly instructive on why we should lean towards the latter. So I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to jump into chapter 2 because it's a lot of verses today. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your servant Daniel. His, his life was not easy. Uh, we thank you for his faithfulness and the faithfulness of his friends. We thank you that he wrote it down and that it was passed down faithfully from Hebrew to Hebrew to Hebrew all the way down until it made it into the Bible and came to us, Lord. May we look and, and see this this instance, this, this time in Daniel's life, and may it speak freshly to us today in the year 2022, that we might serve you, that you might grow our faith, and that we might be faithful. And I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's read. I'm going to pick up in chapter 2. I'm going to read the first 16 verses, and then we'll stop and talk about it. It says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians and the enchanters, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, 
and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. And then the Chaldean said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we'll show you the interpretation. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation... You shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. And they answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. And the king answered and said, Now, I know with certainty you're trying to gain time, because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words for me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. And the Chaldeans answered the king and said, There's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. This thing that the king asks is difficult. And no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who has gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Nebuchadnezzar is king of Babylon. He is the king that has taken over Judah, right? And Nebuchadnezzar goes to sleep one night in his palace, and he has a dream, right? And in Babylonian culture and in many of the ancient cultures, dreams were considered significant. Some of them. Most of them were recognized to be kind of the same way we dream, right? You, 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 they reflect the state of the dreamer's mind. Like I can remember back when, when I was a CPA and, and working in the accounting world and in busy seasons, you know, I'd be running 70, 80 hours a week and I would dream at night about accounting and wake up like in a panic that I'd missed a deadline, Right? Because sometimes that happens, but every now and then, right? And, and they recognize, right? Babylonian culture recognized that that was, but there were some dreams that were message dreams. Something important was being revealed to the ruler by the gods through the dream. Usually it was to a leader that was in a crisis situation. There was something and it was very important and it was about the future, Right? And this wasn't unusual, and it wasn't, it wasn't uh, kind of limited to Babylon. You remember the story of Joseph in, in the Old Testament, right? Joseph, who's in the employ of Pharaoh. Pharaoh has a dream, seven fat cows, seven skinny cows. You guys remember that, right? It's a prophetic dream. There's going to be seven years of plenty. There's going to be seven years of famine. So this is not isolated to Babylonian culture. But once the dream happened, it had to be recorded quickly. So there were usually people waiting near the king's chambers that if he woke up in the morning, he would describe the dream, right? Because just like if you've ever dreamed, you wake up, sometimes the dream is very fresh, 30 minutes later you can't remember anything about it. You guys ever do that, right? So not any different with Babylonian kings either. So these, these, these dreams, right, would, so you'd have people on hand to, to record them, and they were highly symbolic. They're not straightforward. They were symbols, and, and so they had actually manuals of dream symbols. Uh, George Schwab has a great little commentary on the book of Daniel, uh, and he, he, giving an example for one of them, he said this. He says, for example, if the dreamer eats a hyena, he will have an evil seizure. If I ate a hyena, I think I'd have a seizure too. Uh, if he eats a beaver, there'll be a rebellion. If he sits, like sits down on any number of things, meanings are specified for each and so on. 
So this normal process that would happen, the king would have the dream. They would record the dream. The king would then take that and give that to his advisors. And the counselors would do their thing, and they'd bring back the interpretation of the dream. Now, here's the critical thing, right? These dreams had to be interpreted. It was worse for the king. It was worse for the kingdom. It was worse for the rulers for them not to know than for them to know and it even be bad, right? Like it would anger the gods if they didn't decode it. And whatever that judgment would be would be even greater than what was coming in the dream. So to not know was worse. And so that's why it says, right, his dream, his spirit was troubled, his sleep left him. So the king summons his wise men and his counselors, right? And they had, ancient kings had all these different kinds of counselors around it. And this passage mentions four, right? Magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and Chaldeans. Who are these people? The magicians, right, were like the researchers and the scholars. They collected literature and wisdom from all the different cultures around them. Think of them as like, almost like librarians, right? They would pull all this stuff in. They would read it. They would digest it. They would understand it and so that they could use it, right, for service in their particular kingdom. So if you remember the story of Jesus' birth, the magi that show up are descended from this kind of class of people. That's your magicians, right? They did dabble a little bit in the occult side of things, too. That was mostly, though, the enchanters and the sorcerers. The enchanters were actually necromancers. Uh, They used spirits. They used spells. They used rituals to speak to the spirit world and to speak to the dead and seek answers and seek wisdom down that occult pathway. The sorcerers dabbled in witchcraft, another type of spell and ritual to manipulate and learn from the spirit in the physical world. So these are your occult practitioners. And the Chaldeans were astrologers. They tracked movements in the heavens and the stars and the planets and tried to use those to predict the future. And they seemed to be the spokespeople. So the king summons them, right? He gives them an ultimatum. Tell me the dream, give me its interpretation, or I'm going to rip you limb from limb and burn your house down. Can you imagine like showing up to work and your boss being like, tell me what I'm thinking right now, or I'm going to rip you limb from limb or burn your house down, right? And kill all your coworkers. I mean, it's a little bit of pressure, but we'll get there in a minute. So I can imagine they're like, <laughs> right, okay, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now tell us, tell us the dream. And we'll give you the interpretation, right? And the king says, no, that's not what I said. You tell me the dream, and then I'll know that you're qualified to actually give me the interpretation. And what do they say? There's not a man on earth who can do that. And they're right. No great and powerful king has ever asked anybody to do this. His counselors aren't up to the task. Why? And here's the first kind of big ticket item from this particular passage. Because at the end of the day, human wisdom, guys, isn't good enough for the important questions of life. It's just not good enough. The big picture, right, that we're wrestling with here is who do you turn to for help and understanding and navigating the big questions, the deep questions, the important questions? Like Nebuchadnezzar knew Nebuchadnezzar knew this was important, and he turned to the best minds he had around him. He turned to his scholars. He turned to his sorcerers. He turned to his astrologers. And what you're meant to see here is that the best of, and this is the biggest, most grand empire in the world right now, right? That the best they have to offer, the most learned, the most educated, those with all the theories, those with the special knowledge, the most widely read, they fall short and they can't help. Now, it's not that the wisdom and the knowledge that we pick up in this world is completely useless, right? If you eat a beaver, knowing that you're going to have a seizure is important. Or if your lawnmower breaks a belt, right? The manual and YouTube are your friend. Uh, If you need chemicals to mix to get a desired compound, a chemistry book has the answer. If I open up the Bible, it's not going to tell me how to change the oil in my car. So there's knowledge that we accumulate is good, but when it comes to the big questions of life, what does the future have in store for me? 
Is anybody watching over me? Like, where am I going? Who's in charge of it? What can I turn to to understand and to, and to, and to be filled with, with wisdom and guidance? The wise of this world fall woefully, woefully short. They don't know what's going to happen or what it means. There's not a man or woman on earth that can do what you're asking. Human wisdom, it doesn't get there. It falls short. So does the occult. Nebuchadnezzar also turns to his occult advisors. And here's kind of the, it, this passage doesn't explicitly lay this out, but it very much says it, right? This kind of demonic wisdom, right, should be avoided. Don't turn to the spiritualists, to the palm readers, to the crystal ball, to the tarot cards, because they seek spirits, right, and speak to the dead. They don't have the answers, and quite frankly, they're dangerous. He can't give answers to the deep questions, right? Nebuchadnezzar turns to his necromancers and his witches, the ones whose knowledge extend kind of beyond the bounds of human wisdom, into the realms of dead, into the realms of the spirits, into magic. But they don't have any answers with else either. When they have to come up with a dream and interpretation, right, they strike out swinging. It's dangerous, right? What we read, it doesn't specifically lay it out here because Daniel knows he's writing to Old Testament Hebrews, right? In the Old Testament Hebrews, know what the scriptures say. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. Listen to this. This is Old Testament. Daniel knows this. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter as an offering. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you're about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Why? Because they're demonic in origin. These insights, this knowledge, it doesn't come from God. And even though there may be some insight there, right? these powers, these creatures that are behind this, they don't have your best interests in mind. This section is meant to remind us that the best this world and the occult world has to offer isn't good enough. So where do you turn? Do you turn to human philosophers, right? When, when, the, when you're wrestling with the deep stuff of life, are you looking to the politicians and the wise men and the wise women? Are you looking to the Ouija boards and the palm readers and the witches? Are you turning to the government and to the writers and to the podcast and the TikToks, right, who can offer nothing more than regurgitated insufficient worldly wisdom? Like, who are you turning to? Daniel tells us that, that if this is where we're going, we're not going to find good answers here. We don't know yet where to go from the passage. But Daniel makes very sure to point out where we shouldn't go. So the king's guard, a man named Ariok, goes out to collect all the wise men, right? He comes in, reports to work today. He says, your job today is to go find all the wise men and rip them limb from limb and burn their houses down. Just a normal day at work, right? And Daniel is one. And so he goes and he rounds up Daniel. And Daniel, it says, with prudence and discretion, just kind of says, hey, why is this so urgent? And Ariok explains it to him. And Daniel goes in and asks for an audience with the king. Why? Because Daniel doesn't see an obstacle. He sees an opportunity. Here's the second thing I want you guys to remember today. Great opportunities Great opportunities to trust and rely and turn to God often come in the moments of greatest pressure. I'm going to pick up in verse 17, right? This is the situation. Daniel's been told, you got to declare the king's dream and interpret it or you're all going to die. Verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then 
the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what's in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you. If you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, to whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, and he went in and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. He's taking a little bit of credit there, right? He really didn't find him. Daniel kind of found him. But... I might be tempted to take credit for that too. And the king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream that I've seen in its interpretation? And Daniel answered the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dreams and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your mind. How do we take advantage of opportunities that come into our path, right? We talked about this last week. Right? We've got to stand by our convictions. You can see Daniel's convictions in this pattern. It doesn't give it, like he says, guys, the, the, the wise men, the enchanters, the magicians, the astrologers, they're not going to be able to help you with this. There's one God in heaven who reveals mysteries. There's one God who can do this. Daniel knows that there's only one way to do this, and he is convinced, convicted beyond a shadow of a doubt. He's so convicted of it that he goes to the king and books an appointment to come give the king the interpretation before he ever gets it. Did you guys pick up on that? Daniel goes and stands, he pulls out his iPhone and he sends the king, right, a meeting request before he knows what the dream means or even is. Why? Because Daniel is convinced. And Daniel knows that if I step out on faith, this is the only chance I've got. And so he acts, right? What do we say you need? You need conviction, you need faith, you need wisdom. You see all of those in this passage. He's replied with prudence and discretion. Then, Daniel goes to his house. He gathers Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, and he says, fellas, we need to pray, and we need to pray a lot. And we need to seek mercy from God. And Daniel and his friends, they hit their knees, and God answers. Verse 18, right? And then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. God tells him, this is what Nebuchadnezzar saw. And this is what it means. And Daniel then breaks into this praise of God. Blessed is God. God changes the time and seasons. You set up kings and remove them. You give wisdom. You reveal deep and hidden things. You know what's in the darkness. I give you thanks and praise for you've given this to me. This is who you are. Right? There's an opportunity here, people, to save his own life and the life of his friends and the lives of all the wise men. There's an opportunity here to show this pagan, powerful king who the real God is. An opportunity to bless the land that he lives in, this land that kidnapped him, this land that has taken him captive, right? This land that has probably made him into a eunuch. I didn't remember that. I didn't say that these past weeks, but he probably has been. If the chief of the eunuchs is in charge of him, guess what that means? 
Like this land that really hasn't done Daniel a whole lot of flavor, favors. But this comes in a moment of great pressure. Imagine knowing that if you don't get this right, that you and your three friends and everybody that you work with on a daily basis, rip limb from limb, house burned down. But that's often, guys, how great opportunities come. Daniel's faith and conviction was sufficient to carry him through. The question is, when these moments come in your life, what are you going to do? What will you do, right? You're, you're likely not going to have one where it's life or death. That's probably not going to happen to you. But what about the pressure of the work meeting where they're, they're, they're pushing you, right, to, 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 to agree to this or do to that? What about the family situations that you get in? What about school board discussions? Will you stand by your convictions? Will your faith carry you through? Will you act with prudence and wisdom and discretion? These great opportunities come at moments where it seems like the cost is too much. Daniel knew God, trusted God. The question the text asks us is, what are you going to do when that happens? So what is the result? Let's check out verse 31. It says, you saw, O king, Daniel begins talking to Nebuchadnezzar. He's standing in the throne room, right? You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold. Its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces, became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. Let's pause there, right? Nebuchadnezzar sees a vision. It's, it's like this statue. We'll show you a picture of it here in, in just a second. The head is made of gold. The chest and arms are of silver. The torso and the thighs are made of bronze. The legs begin uh, iron, and they continue iron down until you get into the feet, and then it becomes a mixture of iron uh, and clay. And so while the king was dreaming and looking at this statue, this rock or this stone was cut out. We don't know of what, but by no human hands, right? And this stone comes and proceeds to pulverize the statue. It destroys the feet, then presumably the statue falls, right? And the rock proceeds to just beat it until it's dust. And then the dust just blows away on the wind. And then the stone keeps growing and growing and growing and growing until it fills the whole earth. What in the world is this? I'm going to pick up in verse 36. This was the dream. Now we'll tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory into whose hand he's given wherever they dwell, the children of man, beasts of the field, birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. That's the silver. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partially iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they'll not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. In these days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone that was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, 
and its interpretation, sure. So it looked something like this, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw. What we have, what Daniel tells him, is it's a prophetic dream of the future, of the rise and fall of four nations that are going to play out over the next six centuries. The head of gold is actually meant to symbolize Nebuchadnezzar. He says, you, O king, are the head, right? Babylon is the kingdom of gold. It's the first kingdom and the current kingdom. And in the value system of the dream, it's the most valuable because the value system of the dream is based on who has the most, how much power does the king have? And in Babylon, it was a full autocracy, right? The, The king had unlimited power. He could say something today, he could back away from it tomorrow and say something completely different. And that's just the way they rolled in Babylon. Right? And the Babylonian Empire... Uh, lasted from about 605 to about 539 when the silver empire arose. The chest, right, and the arms that you see is the Medo-Persian empire comes on the scene. We'll actually see them in Daniel chapter 5. In the viewpoint of, of the day of Daniel's time, this empire will be a little less beautiful, a little less glorious, because the king has a little less autocratic power. You'll see that in, in chapter 5. Once the king makes a decree, he can't back away from it. Right? Because that's the law of the Medes and the Persians. So it's, it's a little less uh, valuable. His power is more limited. But the Persian Empire lasts from 539 to about 331. After that, the empire of the bronze, the torso and the thighs, you can see, right? Like the belt uh, and moving down in the thighs. Bronze is even less valuable and less desirable. But this kingdom shall rule over the entire earth everything in their part of the world. And that's exactly what happened when Alexander the Great burst onto the scene and began invading Persia in 334 and finally crushed it in 331 and created a kingdom that extended from Eastern Europe all the way to India. And some shadow of that lived on until 136, 146, until the legs and feet of iron took over and Rome arose. Iron is the least beautiful, it's the least valuable, it's the least prestigious, but it is very useful for crushing your opponents and subduing people, right? Rome is the iron empire that conquers the world again, but it's also the clay empire that toward the end, right, the toes began to turn into clay. So many different people groups, so many different ideas and philosophies that they don't mix and they can't bond and they can't form a cohesive society and government. And so the empire turns out ultimately to be very brittle. All of which leads us into the midst of all of this, this stone gets cut out. This rock which Daniel says is a kingdom that will never be destroyed, but will break in pieces all the others and bring them to an end. It'll stand forever, not set up by human hands, that keeps growing and growing and growing until eventually it takes up the whole world. What's that kingdom? I want you to listen to a passage from Luke 20. It's a parable. A guy sets up a vineyard. He rents it out to tenants. He tries to send people back to collect some money from him and what he's owed time and time and time again. They beat him, they cast him out, they, you know, they stone him, they throw him away. Eventually, he sends his son. Here's what happens. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir, let us kill him that the inheritance will be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He'll come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. But they said, this is like the scribes and the Pharisees all around, they were like, surely not. But he looked directly at them and he said, What then then, is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Right? Jesus and his kingdom are the stone. The king is born during the rule of the Iron Empire, during the rule of Rome. 
king that his own people rejected and the world rejected. A kingdom that is set up not by human hands, but by the hands of God. A kingdom that begins insignificantly with the birth of a single man in a tiny town in the middle of Israel and, and ends with his death on a cross. But a kingdom that surely grows and grows and grows and outlives and overcomes them all. It's the kingdom of the mustard seed of the parable, right? That is the smallest of the seeds but grows into a great tree. That stone is the kingdom of God and his son Jesus Christ. And Nebuchadnezzar's dream foretold exactly what was going to happen for the next six centuries until God brought about the kingdom of God. So here's kind of the final couple of thoughts for you guys to write down today. Who are you going to put your faith and trust in? Put your faith in the God who sees and directs the future. Right? This, guys, this is, a, this is a direct biblical prophecy in the Old Testament of what's coming down the line. And we can look back and go, wow. Who are you going to turn to, right? Are, are you going to turn to the, you know, the people around you and the, and the wisdom of today or, or to the occult and the witches and the sorcerers, right? Are you going to turn to the God that says, here's what's coming down the line. I know what empires are rising. I know what empires are falling. I know what's coming next. I'm directing all of this and all through this, here's my kingdom that's coming and it's going to grow and it's going to grow and it's going to outlive every single one of these, Right? Let this account grow your faith in the God you serve. If he knew what was coming with Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome and the birth of Jesus, he knows what's coming next in America. If he had a plan to bring about and grow his kingdom out of all that, he's got a plan to continue to grow his kingdom today. And it's still growing. And he's got a plan for your role in that growth. To give you more faith. So here's the last thing I'll leave you with. Here's kind of, to me, if you're going to remember one thing from today, write this down. Don't get stuck in the statue. Build your life on the stone. Don't get stuck in the statue. Like it's good to understand Daniel's description of the vision, right? But to a certain degree, understanding what nations, like it, that's not the main point. The point of it is the rock. As long as we understand what that means, then Daniel's interpretation of the dream. Nebuchadnezzar, honestly, was probably a little disturbed, right? Imagine you're sitting there and the, Daniel comes and says, you know, your empire is going to end, right? Babylon has risen. Babylon is going to fall. Persia is going to rise. Persia is going to fall. Nations will rise. Nations will fall. This is the flow of history, the flow of time, the flow of the future. Nations will rise. Nations will fall. It can be a little disturbing to us as well because what does it tell us? America will rise. America will fall. Nations will come. Nations will go. They're not important. What's important is the stone the kingdom of God and the people of God in the church. Don't get stuck building your home in the statue, in the value system of the statue. It's going to rise. It's going to fall. It's not going to stand the test of time. Daniel's interpretation was a warning not to build your life around the systems of this world. They're not going to hold up. They're going to fall but instead to build it on the rock. Jesus echoes that. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 5. Chapter 7, excuse me. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat against his house and it fell and great was the fall. That's the principle. Build it on the stone. Listen to the words of Jesus. Follow them and it won't matter what happens? Nations rise, nations fall. It won't matter because your future is safe in the hands of God. Your future is understood by God. It may be a, a blessed, easy future. It may not be. That's 
the heart of what Daniel 2 tells us. And Daniel will live this out. He will live the rise of Babylon and the fall of Babylon. Daniel will continue to serve all the way into the Persian Empire. He'll see some of his vision begin to come through, right? Daniel will be there, right, as Babylon, the city that he has served for generations, or excuse me, for decades and decades and decades, collapses, and he'll begin to serve a new king because the kingdom doesn't really matter. It's the rock that Daniel's life was built on, and that's what carries him from kingdom to kingdom to kingdom. So what happens at the end, right? We got like five verses here. Daniel tells him this, King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, right? King falls down on his face in front of Daniel and pays homage to Daniel. Kings don't typically do this. And commanded that the offering and the incense be offered up to him. And the king answered and said to Daniel, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you've been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel's now in charge of all the wise men. Daniel made a request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? That's Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained in the king's court, right? This pagan king recognized the superiority of our God, of your God. God of gods, Lord of lords, revealer of mysteries. Daniel's promoted high honors, ruler over the entire province of Babylon, chief prefect over the wise men. That's going to come into play later because they don't really like that. So they try to have him killed. That's chapter 6. Yep. Uh, Then he goes and he puts in a good word with the king for his three buddies, right? And they get promoted too. What is God doing? He's giving them what they need to thrive in their circumstances. There's no fairy tale ending still. They aren't taken out and sent back to Jerusalem. They aren't reunited with their families. They aren't, and none of that happens. But God is giving them what they need to thrive in their circumstances. And listen, church, the lesson of Daniel, build your life on the rock. Make it central to your life, and God will give you what you need to thrive and bring him glory, even as nations rise and nations fall. Okay? I'm going to pray for us. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for today and for this, this, this message from your your servant Daniel. May it sink into us, right? May we have seen it, may we have heard it, may we have understood it, uh, and may it find its way down deep into our hearts and change the way we think of things, change who we turn to for wisdom and for guidance. Encourage us to come to you because you, you alone are the God that gives wisdom, that sees the future, that directs the future. Lord, as, as, as we continue through life, we may continue to live on in a, in a good and stable country, or we may not. Our nation may rise, our nation may fall. Keep our lives planted firmly on the rock of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's his, his name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, church. God bless you guys this Sunday. God keep you. God make his face to shine upon you. God bathe you uh, in his presence and give you his peace. Uh, We will see you guys in a couple of weeks. Bye.